You know, humanity has always been fascinated with the new, and it's in our nature to look ahead to whatever the newest, to the latest, whatever the greatest is. But over the years, though, I have noticed that, you know, everything that was once new has a quick way of becoming normal and the norm in our lives. Take the example of electricity. You know, imagine how exciting it must have felt in the early 1900s as those first set of families had electricity installed in their homes. And if you were blessed enough to be one of those people, now back then, it would have mostly just been lights, uh, but eventually electricity that was once revolutionary would become the norm, and even more than that, it would become the expectation of every civilization. Or how about the dawn of commercial aviation? It must have been a whole new world in the mid-1915s and beyond as commercial aviation really began to take off. Uh, You know, people could suddenly go places that they weren't able to go before. Aviation redefined and shrunk our world. Um, And soon enough, you know, the revolutionary prospect of even international travel would become the, the norm where to the point where today it's considered part of the very fabric of our society, so much so, in fact, that when COVID hit, we were all faced with a prospect that we'd never been faced with before. We were stuck. (laughs) We couldn't go places like we used to. And, you know, we realized that we probably took this revolutionary thing for granted. Uh, You know, computers are another great example. Few things have revolutionized our lives so much as the dawn of computers. You know, they, they started before the 1970s, but it wasn't until the 70s that they started showing up more. And then in the 80s and the 90s, the technologies just kept taking off and accelerating until we could do all kinds of amazing things on our computers uh, and, and to the point where now we all have a crazy supercomputer in our pockets uh, that could outperform anything that even existed in the mid-2000s. Um, and so the the insane technologies that were once so new and revolutionary quickly became the norm. You know, norms quickly become expected and taken for granted. Another place that we often see this is with our jobs. We often think secretly that the ticket to greatest satisfaction and happiness in life is a newer, better paying job. Now, it's always great to strive to achieve higher and and reach higher in life, but it's also true that our same old tendencies and our same old struggles that we had in our old jobs will eventually show up in our new jobs or any new job that we walk into. See, every Everything that was once new quickly becomes the norm yet again, and we have to deal with ourselves and our old tendencies and our insecurities all over, all over again. And, and one place that we really see this new becoming the norm phenomenon is in the realm of relationships. You know, many pray for a new friendship, and that's a good thing, especially if you feel lonely. There's lots of good ones here, so if you invest here, there's lots of friendships that can come into your life. Uh, Many singles also and especially pray for a new romantic relationship. You know, and in the early days of a relationship, things are exciting and, and new and, and, you know, that's kind of, you know, the joy of newfound love and all that stuff. But the longer a couple is together, and especially in marriage, mar- uh, married couples have to relearn, sometimes daily really, how to keep their love for one another new, even though it's the same two people that are in the relationship together till death do them part. We love new things. We we often find hope in the new. I love new stuff. I'm, I'm not immune from that myself. Uh, I look forward to things that are happening in the future, and it is a good thing to do that. I'm always looking up and ahead to what God has in store for here at City Church. Um, and at the same time, I'm the kind of person that finds joy in the same things in my life. I'm a very weird bird, okay? Um, I love waking up at the same time working out at the same hour, having my coffee in the same place, you know, with seasoned the exact same way that I like it in the morning. Uh, I, I love enjoying my same morning routines after that. I love going to lunch at the same hour every single day. Uh, I love having my afternoon routines that are more or less the same. I love going home to the same family for dinner. Amen? There's something powerful about that. I, I love doing dishes at the same old 
sink every single day. Um, I, I, I love serving at the same church for a long time. In fact, as long as God would possibly have me. In fact, one of my dreams is to be a founder builder uh, and, and who's able to make a huge impact by staying in one place for a very long time. That's been my prayer from, from day one. And I can now say that Lisa and I have pastored this church from t- beginning to today. It's been 12 and a half years. And so we celebrate what God has done, but we also know that we're still just getting started. There's still so much ahead. But one thing in my life that is never the same is my marriage because my wife makes everything new and beautiful every single day. I, I mean, you know, I, I love being married to the same woman every day. Um, and, and she just has a way of making our home full of love and joy and doing so much that even though it's the same experience, it feels like a new one every day. Um, and, and I find tremendous power in my life in doing the same things. And so you see, the fact is, Even though we all love to look forward to the new things in our life, there is so much power in enriching the same things that God already has in our lives. And so my message title today is The Power of the Same. And I want to encourage everyone here today to open a Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you got a physical Bible, you can swipe there now. Uh, If you didn't bring a Bible with you, Grab the YouVersion app, and you can find the book of 1 Corinthians on there that way. And while you're turning or swiping there, what I'm going to talk about today is not the same old, same old. That's different. Uh, What I'm going to talk about today is the power of the same grace of God that has existed since the dawn of time throughout all church history, and that is specifically celebrated through the act of communion uh, that we're going to do at the end of our service today. And we're going to read the Apostle Paul connect the act of taking communion even further back than when Jesus was here to the time of the Israelites in the Exodus. Some of you are like, what? Jesus wasn't around yet. I'll explain. Paul is going to tell us that the new work that Christ did on the cross, which we remember and we celebrate by taking communion, was actually connected to the the experience that the Israelites had in the wilderness. And the same grace of Jesus was at work then, uh, before Jesus ever came. It's an astonishing connection between the New Testament and between the Old Testament that we're going to look at. And it's the next part of our ongoing study and series in the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you would, we're going to read verses one through four together. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for being the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, thank you that with you, there is nothing that we, uh, no changes surprise you, uh, no wars surprise you, God, no crises of planet earth or, or for our, our own lives for that matter. None of it surprises you. You know everything from beginning to end. And yet in the midst of it, you operate and you step into our lives, you step into time and you want to be our God walking us through each and every single step. So I pray today, Lord, that it would just be another day in that journey. Uh, but Lord, not just another day, it, a, another day in a special way, God, where we get to learn new things about your grace and your love for each and every single one of us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see from your word. We pray that you would open our ears to hear what you want us to hear from it. And most importantly, open our hearts wide open today that we might respond and become the disciples you want us to be as a result of having spent a little time together and a little time in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4 says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. So the very first thing that Paul does in these first four verses that we read is to connect the experience of the Israelite in the wilderness to the same Christ who we worship today. And Paul specifically cites connections between baptism and the Lord's Supper to things that happened before Jesus ever arrived. And that's huge because those are the two main sacraments of the Christian church. And so what that brings me to today is the first point on your note sheet that I would love for you to jot down if you're following along. Um, if you got a paper one, you can pull that out. Otherwise, you can go to lovehopecity.com slash notes and you can follow there on your phone. But the foundation is this. The same God who was at work in the Bible wants to do a new work in me. 
See, Paul connects the experience of the Israelites to the journey of the early Christians in uh, the first century AD in verses one through four. And two times he connects them using the word. In fact, the exact word he uses is the word same. Paul doesn't use the word similar. He uses the word same. And that is huge uh, because Paul says that they ate the same spiritual food and that they drank the same spiritual drink. And in verses one to two, uh, he uses that word uh, same directly to connect the Israelite grace experience to the Christian concept of grace that we understand. And the first Christian concept that Paul connects to the Israelites here is that of baptism. Um, and, and Paul specifically says that the Israelites were under the cloud together and that they were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. Now, obviously, this one is not the exact same baptism as we understand it today uh, because Christ had not yet come. And that's why for the baptism one is the one of that the, the word same is not used. We'll get to the ones that it is used in a minute. But for, for baptism, Paul is implying a similarity between them. Uh, but the similarity is this. Just as we are baptized into Jesus, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Israelites were baptized into Moses in a way of speaking. Uh, now, I once heard a pastor suggest that the Israelites were baptized into Moses or immersed into his leadership. And that that's the connection that Paul was getting at here. Another author that I uh, read from time to time named Craig Blongberg, he agreed with it and he put it this way. He said, obviously, the Israelites were not immersed in literal water. Baptism here suggests identification with and allegiance to the leader of a spiritual community. But think about it this way. The Israelites went through the water, which was the Red Sea, together. They left one experience behind in Egypt. They died to that old life because they could never go back to it again. And they came out to a new, more free existence that they lived in in the future. It's an example of this type um, uh, that, that is similar to the Christian concept of baptism. And in Christian baptism, what we understand is that we are symbolically buried with Christ. When we go under that water, you know, it's that symbolism that you died to your old life. And when you come out of that water, you're symbolically rising to a new life. And as we come up from the water, we awake to this new, more free reality in Christ. And so Paul says that experience is similar. But then in the next two concepts that he mentions in verses three to four, he specifically uses the word same. Paul directly connects the spiritual and physical food that the Israelites ate in the wilderness to Christ. And he's building this argument here that we eat the same spiritual food and drink the same spiritual drink that they did through Christ, that he is our connection to them and, and that they are, or the, the, and same thing, that, that the people of the Old Testament were connected to us through Jesus. And so check out this wording in, in verse three specifically. Um, he, he says that all ate the same spiritual food and all drank from the same spiritual drink and the rock that they drank from was Christ. Now help me out if you're a Bible person, you know this here. What was the food that the Israelites ate in the wilderness? Manna, right. Anyone in here have any manna pancakes for, for breakfast this morning? Nobody? Okay, cool. Um, so, so it's like, how do we eat the same food if he's saying that, that we, 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 you know, we eat different stuff? Well, what manna was, if you don't know, it's literally bread that came down from heaven that sustained the Israelites during this desert existence. Now, in John 6, 35, Jesus tells us, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, it's interesting that he also uses the word thirst in John 6, 35, uh, because in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul tells us that the Israelites all drank the same spiritual drink. Now, help me out. Where did the Israelites get their water from? In the wilderness. They got it from the rock. Moses strikes the rock. The water comes out. They're in the desert. They're in a place where there's, there's no rock there. And, and now if my memory, my Bible memory serves me right, it happened a couple of times and at least one of them, Moses lost his temper. And <laughs> that's a sermon for another day uh, about being a pastor. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but Paul connects the rock that the, that um, Paul connects the rock that gave the Israelites water to Christ saying that rock that, that Moses struck where the water came out, he says that was actually actually the same. He says that rock was actually Christ. Now, the drink that we drink it 
communion is, is, is we use the grape juice. It's not the real stuff in case anyone's wondering here. Uh, but it is symbolically to remember the blood that Jesus spilled on the cross. Um, and in these first four verses, Paul is building a connection between the baptism, between the manna, between the water of the Israelites, and he's building all of that to Christ. And then later in chapter 11, Paul is essentially, he's going to talk about communion, and he's going to directly connect the spiritual food and drink of Christ to that of the Israelites. And what Paul is getting at here with this whole explanation in these first four vo- verses is it's the same God who's been writing the same salva- one big salvation story for all of history, and the same God who is at work in the Israelites in the wilderness was also at work in the lives of the Corinthians that Paul was writing to, and that same God also wants to do a new work every single day in me and you. And the manna that we eat daily is Jesus. He is our bread of life. The water that we drink is the satisfaction of the Holy Spirit whose living water causes us to never, ever thirst again. And and so it's the same story that's been going on for all time. And the Bible isn't just a bunch of, of words on a page. It is a living testament to the fact that God is still alive, that he is still active today that he still wants to do a new work in your life today. And now I want to read verses five and six. Verse five, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. I hope that God doesn't write that about me or my family. (laughs) With most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. This takes me to the next thing I'd have you jot down on your note sheet if you're following along. God gives us all the same examples, but it's up to us to follow them. God gives us all the same examples, but it's up to us to follow them. Every Christian has the same biblical examples, but you know, it's up to each individual Christian to actually follow those examples. And then in verses five and through 11, uh, it talks about the example of the Israelites in the wilderness and mostly their sin, that it should be every Christian's teacher. And verse five is a great reminder that even though the Israelites drank from the rock that is Christ, that God wasn't pleased with them and ultimately they were overthrown in the wilderness. This is an example of the failure of the Israelites after crossing the Red Sea. And that example has served as an enduring reminder for every generation generation since then. That's why verse 6 literally says these things took place as an example for us. So biblical examples are often the very best way to learn. In fact, they are. They're always the very best way to learn a life lesson. I found that in life, there are three main ways to learn a lesson. And the number one best way to learn it is by following the teachings of the Bible and its example. Uh, you know, most people date the Exodus event to somewhere around 1200 or 1300 BC. And that makes this a more than 3000 year old lesson to learn from, okay? And this same lesson has existed in the Bible that entire time so that people don't have to repeat that lesson. But unfortunately, we don't always learn our lessons from the Bible and its wisdom, right? Uh, You know, one of the lessons referenced about the Israelites was their grumbling in the wilderness. Um, and, And it's a lesson, certainly, for all of us to consider. But help me out. Are there still Christians who grumble at God? Yeah, let's make this a little bit more personal. Do you ever grumble at God? I I know I do, okay? I'm gonna raise my hand and admit it. I wish I didn't, okay? I wish I never complained, and I try to do it less and less as I grow and as I mature in Christ. But the fact is, we all do it. And what Paul's getting at here is the best way to learn an example or a lesson is through the teachings of the Bible and the examples in following its wisdom. And these same words and lessons have been written for us so we don't have to repeat those mistakes. And that's why the best way to learn a lesson in life is by following the teachings of the Bible and its wisdom. The second way, great way to learn a lesson is through the example of godly people or leaders or successful people who have gone before us. Uh, now, believe Believe it or not, 
You probably know people who have already paid many of the dumb taxes that you don't need to pay <laughs> in your life. And, and, and so uh, after the wisdom and the examples of Scripture, the examples of godly and successful people uh, are great teachers for all of us who can help us to learn a great many things. Now, here's the third way to learn a lesson. The school of hard knocks. <laughs> And what Paul doesn't say here, but is pretty clear, is he doesn't want us to learn our life lessons that way. Now, unfortunately, way too many of us do. And Paul is almost begging the Corinthian Christians here not to repeat the mistakes of the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness. And then in verse 11, Paul makes it clear. He says, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. So the point that I'm getting at is this. God gives us all the same examples to follow in the Bible as well from other people's lives, but it's up to us to follow them. See, I've got to actually make that decision that I'm not just going to let this be a lesson on a page somewhere, that this is going to be something that I actually believe is true and try to implement in my life and actually do. Um, and now I won't read it today, but I'll briefly summarize verses 18 through 22. Later on in verses 18 to 22, Paul's going to talk about these kind of idolatrous pagan worship feasts that were happening in the Corinthian culture at the time. And what Paul's doing is he's drawing a parallel between the sins of the Israelites then and the behavior of the Corinthians at that time. Um, and see, the Israelites then had access to the bread of God, which was the manna, um, and, 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 the, and the Corinthians, they had access to the bread of God being Jesus Christ. And, but instead, many of them were also choosing to follow this idolatrous pagan lifestyle. And the connection that Paul was trying to make was to tell the Corinthians, listen, don't be involved in these, these pagan feasts that are going on. Don't repeat the sins of the Israelites. People have gone before you and already done these same things. You don't need to repeat these same mistakes. You know, for us in 2022, I see how God might deliver a similar message. Idolatry in 2022 probably doesn't look like it did in the times of the Bible. The idolatry of 2022 is less about pagan worship and a lot more about celebrity worship. The idolatry of 2022 is less about giving offerings to stone statues and images and more about entertainment worship. The idolatry of 2022 is more about distraction worship. You know, one thing that is similar between then and now is that every society pretty much for all time has always had some kind of sexual immorality component to idolatry. It seems like it's a universal theme. And the same God of the Bible has been begging his people to come back to following his ways over our ways, to following his fulfillment over our fulfillment. And God's been giving that same message literally for millennia. You know, many examples of idolatry look a little bit differently today, but the same examples of the Bible continue to speak to today. And just like it was up to Israel to follow the examples of the Bible, just like it was up to the Corinthians to follow the simple examples of the Israelites and the rest of scripture, it is up to you and me to follow the examples of the Bible as well. And that's why Paul says this in verses seven through 11. Let's pick it up in verse seven. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come." You know, verses seven and eight directly connect the word of eating and drinking again to the experience of the Israelites, but this time it's not in a positive way. Uh, the first time that Paul uses that eating and drinking with the same connection, he's saying it's because they ate and drank from Christ. But this time it's about how they had access to eating and drinking of God, but instead they chose to go eat and drink to their own pleasures, to uh, immoral things. And so Paul tells us that because of their idolatry, 23,000 Israelites fell in 
a single day. Now, I'm here to tell you that grumbling was actually not the chief sin of the Israelites, even though it's the one that we most often associate or connect with them. You know, pastors be like, don't grumble, God might kill you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I don't think that we should grumble either, okay? But that's not the reason that God killed them. And if you grumble, God's not going to kill you, okay? I promise you, okay? Um, God killed them because of their idolatry. Make no mistake about it. That's why the Lord destroyed them. Grumbling was just a symptom of the idolatry that was happening in their life. And it was because of their idolatry that they wound up making this huge false God and crafting a huge false worship to it and essentially having this kind of pleasure laden, you know, drunk fest, if you will. I don't know what else to call it. And and that's why God killed so many Israelites in that one day. Uh, But none of that is the point of 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, That is just a reminder and an example for every future generation of believers. Uh, That's where it ends. And and in verse 11, it says, all this was written down for our example and for our instruction. But the point of uh, 1 Corinthians 10 is what's coming up in verses 12 and 13. So I'll go ahead and I'll start out by reading verse 12. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. I'm going to go ahead and give you the next point on your note sheet, and then I'll get to verse 13 in a moment. God gives everyone the same ways out of temptation, but it's up to the person to take it. God gives every single person the same strategies to get out of temptation, but it's up to the person to take it. Verse 12 is a crucial turning point in the text, and it is also a crucial turning point of truth for our own lives. It's often when we think that we are the strongest that we are on the brink of a big fall. You know, the most dangerous point for a whole generation of Israelites who thought that they were good happened, uh, you know, right after they had seen God do all this amazing stuff. Now think about it. They had just beat the Egyptians. I mean, the Egyptians were the big, mighty enemy of their day. They had walked through a sea and seen the water get held up on either side. And then they watched God close the water back on the Egyptian army that was pursuing them. And and they all drowned the Egyptians in the water while the Israelites walked to the other side victoriously. Um, and, and so in the mind of the Israelites, man, they had just done some pretty awesome stuff. And God was like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. God's like, I did some awesome stuff. <laughs> you guys griped the whole time, you know? You, you guys thought you were gonna die the whole time. You guys kept complaining to Moses. And, and God's like, you know, every time I gave you a chance to trust me, you guys just repeated the same dumb mistakes. And, and so a bunch of Israelites, they perished right there in the wilderness and only a few ever saw the glory of the promised land. Even Moses himself, we know from scripture, he only gets to see it from afar. And, and so there's a principle for all of us to learn in there and it's this, the precursor to a big fall is often the moment when we think we're good. Have you been there? You're paying the bills just fine. Your relationships seem to be going pretty well. You've got nice stuff in your house. You know, I mean, life is never perfect, right? But uh, things are more or less flowing well. And Paul would remind us, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We need to remind ourselves, friends, that we are not good. (laughs) We are not strong. Uh, We are sinful. We are broken. We are messed up. And we are perpetually just a couple of really dumb mistakes away from ruining our entire lives. That is the fact about every human being on earth. We need to continue to lean on God's strength. We need to continue to lean on God's grace. We need to continue to go back to the truth of God's word. We need to continue to to lean on the church and, and on Christian community uh, to keep ourselves accountable. We need to continue to follow the same basic common sense guidance that has guided Christians on how to overcome temptation since the dawn of time. And that is why Paul lays out verse 13, where he says this, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Uh, question with a show of hands. How many of you like to highlight and mark up your Bibles? 
I, I like to do that in version app. You can actually do it there in the app, which is really cool. So I do that too. This is one you probably want to take one step further than that. This is one of those verses you want to just lock in that brain and memorize it for all time. Make it a personal mantra for your life. And anytime you're in a situation where people start passing things around that you know you shouldn't take, you say, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Or, you know, if you're out on a date late with your boyfriend or with your girlfriend, and you know at times <laughs> the sky's dark, you say, no temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Or you find yourself in a situation at work where you're attracted to somebody who's not your spouse. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You're somewhere, and you notice that people are gossiping about somebody else or talking about them in a way that, that you know isn't right. You say, no temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let me be tempted beyond my ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so I may be able to endure it. You're tempted to do business in a shady way or you notice somebody else around you is doing it. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the what? The way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. I hope the point is being driven home into all of our minds right now. You know, there's a big problem that I see with certainly young people, but a lot of folks these days. You know, a lot of people act like when temptation comes, like they didn't see it coming. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And it's like, I, I have no idea how that website wound up on my phone. I mean, oh wait, you know what I do? The Russians hacked me. <laughs> it's like, you know, okay, dude, you typed it in yourself. You know what I mean? You know exactly how it got there. And, and, and don't play dumb with God and don't play dumb with other Christians. You're really smart. Don't short sell yourself, okay? And we all wanna be treated like grown up Christians, but when we sin, we often play dumb and we act like there wasn't a clear path to the decisions that we made. See, if we wanna be treated like grown up Christians, we need to act like grown up Christians. And one way we can act like a grown up Christian is to guard our hearts heart and our mind from temptation. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Friends, this is not new and fresh advice. <laughs> This is the same old stuff that has existed from the dawn of time that has been spoken to the Israelites, to the Corinthians, to you and me today, and it is as relevant as ever in 2022. And so when Paul is saying that the temptation is common to man, what he's saying is that many people have been through it before. In fact, billions upon billions probably have. And to make it even a little bit more specific, with just a little tiny bit of effort, you can find someone who will give you the help with you need. In fact, they're probably in this church right now. And there are probably people going through what you're going through or maybe something remarkably similar to the issues that you're facing in your life. So the second thing that Paul says in verse 13 is a straight out promise from God. He says, I will always make a way of escape. You can take that as a promise from God, but God's gonna make the way of escape, but we have to take it. If we don't take the off ramp, and he's like, I, I put it there and you didn't take it. And you know, sometimes when we find ourselves in these tempting moments, we think to ourselves, you know, I, I can't get out of this. I'm, I'm too far down the rabbit hole now. And God says, yes, you can. God says, yes, you can. There is always a way of escape, but we have to choose it. As I often do, I'm gonna illustrate this with a toddler story, okay? <laughs> a few weeks ago, Nigel asked me why there was an escape hatch on the top of a bus. 
And I thought, wow, what a great question for a five-year-old to ask. And you know, whenever we go to Disneyland, we ride the Metro City bus because A, it saves money, and you know, Disney's got enough of my money, you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and B, it's faster. That's a little secret for you, okay? So we take the Metro City bus in there down Harbor, the 43, and we show up. And a couple of weeks ago, when we were sitting in there in the bus, Nigel asked me, Dad, why is there an access hole on the top of the bus. And in his mind, if you're going to get out of the bus, that's not the way to do it, <laughs> right? Um, and I explained to him, it's, buddy, it's an escape hatch, you know? So if the bus falls on its side, you'd always have at least two options in terms of sides where you can get out at any given moment. Um, and, and see, at some point in bus history and the tragic history of buses, some folks who you and I will probably never ever know or hear about must have gotten into an accident. And something must have happened where likely they weren't able to get out of the bus because maybe two of the sides were obstructed or whatever, and there was no escape hatch that was there on the top. And so now every bus that ever gets made since then in the history of buses for all time has an escape hatch on the top. And for 99.9999999999, you just kept going, percent of bus rides, nobody ever uses the escape hatch on the top of the bus. In fact, it costs the bus maker extra money to make it because they got to not only carve it out, but they got to pay a worker to do it. You got to put the right fittings and all that. But for that 0.0000000, you keep going for a long time, 0.1% of the time when that bus turns over and one of those sides is blocked and it's the only way out, it's there to save a life. See, somebody with a brain made a plan for contingencies. See, God always makes a way of escape for every sinful situation that we'd ever find ourselves in. And here's what I want to tell you. We can make plans and contingencies too. You want to know what God's best temptation escape hatch for your life is? It's right here. It's your brain. <laughs> You can use it to plan not to get into stupid situations, okay? It's called planning ahead. Planning ahead is the best way to stop blaming other people for our sin and for our choices. You know, too many Christians today, they blame God, they, they blame their parents, they blame society, they, they blame the devil, you know, they blame their parents, they, they blame their wife, they blame their husband for their bad attitude, they blame their job for their stress and why they feel unhappy happy in life. They blame other people for why they're responding to things the way they are. They don't want to take a good hard look in the mirror and place the blame squarely and solely on their own choices for their disobedience. Christian, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. He'll provide an escape hatch so that you may be able to endure it. And God gives everyone the same way out of temptation, but it is up to you and me to take it. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna read uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 through 17, because one of the many things I love about God is he knows that we are prone to wander. He knows we're prone to fall. And that's why he instituted the grace of the Lord for us for all time. That's why he sent his son for us, because he knew there would be times we would fall. And he knew that even when we don't fall, that we still need his grace every day. So let's read verse 14. It says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And so this takes me uh, to the next thing that I'd have you jot down, is that God gives everyone the same reminder that relationship is is always greater than religion. We all need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And you know, the longer that we walk with God, the more that we have to fight to keep that relationship with God from really being a ritual or something that we can go through the motions. And one of the places that God, or one of the things that God inst instituted uh, is communion for us to remember 
uh, just very strategically in our lives what he did for us on the cross. And communion is one of these things that it, you could just go through the motions and you can do it. But God gives us this same reminder all throughout the Bible that we, he wants us to know today that relationship with him is always greater than religion. God desires your heart. He desires relationship with you. And so this cup, and this bread that we have here today uh, is a reminder uh, for all of us that our righteousness, that everything that we have in life, uh, it didn't come from us. It, it all came from him. We aren't going to get anywhere in life by ourselves, but with his grace, with his strength, with his blood, with his power, we will move in power. We will be blessed more than we will ever need. Sure, it's gonna be requiring sacrifice and hard decisions sometimes in life, but God never promised that it was going to be easy. What God promised was that he would be with us all the way, just like the father was with Jesus on the cross. You know, what we just read is that uh, Paul called communion the cup of of blessing, and indeed it is in all of our lives. See, blessing comes from a relationship with Jesus. Anything that we have now in our lives or hope to attain or retain in the future comes from the blood of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 17, it uses that word one body. This is a connection to what Obi talked about last week where the church is this body that is being built up and grown together, that we all have a part to play in it. Um, and the body of Christ literally has Jesus his own blood that was spilled on the cross running through its veins. The body of Christ is literally built upon the innocent, broken sacrifice of Jesus's body and his blood. His wounds and his pain continue to heal and cleanse our wounds. Communion in any church is this unifying moment where we remind ourselves of all the, fa the fact that we are all broken, uh, that no one is any better than the person who's sitting or standing next to you, and that every single one of us here needs the grace of the Lord every single moment of our lives. So today, I am going to invite you all to take communion, and I'm going to jump forward to read verses 23 through 26 first. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. Now we're gonna jump to chapter 11 here, okay? 1 Corinthians 11, 23 says, for I receive what the Lord, what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then verse 27 says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. Um, and so he goes on to just talk about what it means to examine ourselves before we take communion. Friends, in just a minute, we're going to break bread together. And the body of Christ was broken for you and for me. And as you take that little tiny bit of bread that's in front of you, it's a reminder that Jesus's body was broken so that you could be free, so that I could be free, so that we could be standing here today. It is the cup of blessing. And we're changing it up. Normally we do it in the beginning of the service. And, uh, but today I really want every single one of us here to take the time to examine yourself. And so here at City Church, we practice what we call open communion. And that means that you, you don't have to go through a class or anything like that to take communion. All that we ask is that you be a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one thing I always say is no one knows better than you whether or not that's true. <laughs> and if that's not the case, there's no better day than today to settle it once and for all. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. I'm going to give you the chance to become a Christian. And, and then after that, during this next song, we want to invite you down the sides as you feel led. We're not going to like all take it together. So you just grab the bread, grab the little cup, take it back to your seat, take, have a moment with God and uh, take it at your seat and examine yourself and remember what he's done for you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us, for your blood that was spilled for us. God, we thank you that 
any blessing that we have in our lives. It all comes from you. We didn't earn it. We didn't achieve it. There's nothing we could ever do uh, to, to get ourselves further ahead in life. Lord, you are the center of everything. And so we submit ourselves to you today, and we ask for a fresh outpouring of your grace in our hearts and in our lives. And if you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I got to tell you, God promises to do four things for you. He promises to forgive you of your sin, to adopt you into his family, fill you with his Holy Spirit spirit and to give you an eternal life beyond anything that you could ask for or dream or imagine. There's only one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so if you've been window shopping God and the Bible and the claims of Christianity, I want to give you a chance right here and right now to settle it once and for all. It isn't mystical. It isn't magical. God's going to hear the faith as you pray. Just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there, and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit, and give me the power to live this life for you. Lord, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Would you take over? And now, Lord, for the rest of us, God, we come and, and we confess to you that we need you today and always. And if we have to uh, do business with you, if there's any sin that, that we need to confess, Lord, may we come right here and right now and experience a fresh outpouring of your grace. Thank you for your blood that was shed for us. Thank you for your body that was broken for us, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. I don't know if you tasted it, but the bread was a little sweet. Um, this was actually a, a Jewish bread uh, that somebody made, and you can tell them, thank you, I'm looking at the person. It's very, but it was, uh, it's probably similar to the kinds of breads that would have been eaten around that time. Now, we don't know if this is what manna actually tasted like, but we do know that the Bible tells us that it was a honey flake-like thing. And when God gave the Israelites that manna in the wilderness, it was supposed, that little tiny bit of sweetness was supposed to be a reminder for them that even though what they were going through was hard, that there was still a sweetness in following God, the rock. And, and as you and I celebrate communion and, and we take that bread, we, we dip it in the juice or, you know, we combo, we do it separate, however you choose to do yours, I don't know. Uh, the point is that we all remember that no matter what we're walking through in life, Jesus makes it sweet, and he is the rock. In fact, it tells us that we eat the same spiritual food that they ate. We drink the same spiritual drink, and it comes from the rock, and that rock is Jesus. It's his power, it's his strength that's being supplied, that's getting you and I through every day that we go through in life. It's his power that is the reason there's a church here on the corner of Broadway and Citron uh, today, and it's his power that's gonna continue to move you forward in your life. So friend, Move in the sweetness of the rock of Jesus Christ today, we pray. Have a great week, and we'll see you guys next time.